I knew it when I was growing up, just that feeling of insecurity and that fear that if the car breaks down, you're not going to be able to pay for it. I grew up with that feeling and I wanted to get rid of it as soon as I could. And I understood that financial stability was the prerequisite to any other components of building my happiness. So Dave and I, we don't live extravagant lives. We're very careful with our money. We don't buy expensive cars. We invest in things that are going to appreciate as opposed to not. We don't overspend. We don't have credit card debt. We just don't do any of those things that I knew on a daily basis just made me wake up in the morning with the beginnings of a panic attack. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. It's a great day to be alive. Hope you're cognizant of that today and filling your day with all kinds of positive people and activities. I'm having a great day. I'm happy you're here because, well, because you're here, I get to share with you very interesting conversations with fascinating people on the topic of wealth and happiness and what we want from life. And this week's guest is no exception. His name is Kirkland Hamill. He's the author of a brilliant new book called Filthy Beasts. Filthy Beasts, that's right. What does that have to do with money? Well, you'll find out shortly enough, but I'll give you the hint. Kirkland's grandfather is a very wealthy man, and his father was raised in a manner of great wealth and comfort. Then when Kirkland's parents got divorced, he and his brothers went to live in Bermuda with their mom, where they attended a very fancy private school, but often didn't have enough to eat, didn't know how they were going to pay for basic things like groceries. So it is a story from someone who has lived on both sides of the wealth spectrum and lived to tell about it. That's not the only drama in Kirkland's young life, which he uh, captures in this fascinating memoir that I ripped through in like two and a half days. Filthy Beasts, a little bit more about that book and Kirkland in just a moment. Before I do, I want to say thank you to the notes I got from listeners this week. Van Brandenburg, thank you very much. Welcome aboard. Happy you're here. Mary Foddle, I still don't know how to pronounce your last name, Mary. So next time you email me, give me a phonetic breakdown. I was happy to hear from you, Mary. Even though you didn't love the conversation, the guest that I had that conversation with, you know who I'm talking about. Me and you both know who I'm talking about here. And that's okay. Listen, folks. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to not love every conversation on here. It's okay to find some people's ideas, well, not abhorrent, but not to your liking. And that's cool. In our world of cultural wars right now, having a place where we can have conversation and consider other people's views respectfully is a rare thing. And that's the kind of environment I want to create here at Crazy Money. So thank you, Mary, for reaching out and sharing some thoughts on that one conversation in particular. Also, I want you to know, Mary recommended that I have Arthur Brooks, the author on here. I haven't hunted him down yet, but I have started to read his book, Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. And I highly recommend this book, Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. Because with social media and the news cycle being so fast, we're all a hair trigger away from contempt. And we don't give ourselves or others the respect their ideas deserve, the consideration they deserve, even if you find them somewhat abhorrent. We don't need to have contempt for the other people. We need to love those enemies. And I needed to be reminded of this myself. And so thank you, Mary, for for recommending Arthur. We'll see if I can hunt him down. If any of you guys out there know Arthur, hey, send him my way. Also, if you have thoughts, comments, guest recommendations, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you, from you. From is the appropriate preposition in that sentence. Easy for me to say. You can shoot me an email at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Now, let's talk about Filthy Beasts and Kirkland Hamill. I read a review of this book, Filthy Beasts, and I'm going to say it over and over because I don't think Kirkland or I said it during the interview. So I want you to know that Filthy Beasts is the name of the book that was written by Kirkland Hamill, who is my guest today. I read the review of Filthy Beasts in the New York Times. And once I had the basic plot notes of the book, I was like, I got to talk to this guy. Because what happened is Kirkland's family came from money. They had a lot of money. They lived on yachts and went to the most exclusive private clubs in New York and Bermuda and all over the country. And they lived a very fancy lifestyle. And then when their grandfather died, turns out not so much money was around. Thus, 
Kirkland's father, who barely worked, Kirkland's mother, who barely worked, they split up. Then Kirkland's mom takes him and his brothers to Bermuda, where they go to this super fancy private school, and yet at home, they don't know how they're going to pay for groceries, literally. They don't have enough to eat. They have to ration milk and cereal, and it's really sad. Compounding all of this is his mother's and his father's alcoholism. And it's not your garden variety, a uh, couple glasses of wine with dinner alcoholism. It's like scotch with breakfast kind of alcoholism, eh, maybe lunch. But anyway, it all sort of demonstrates this chaos that results from, oh, a good bit of narcissism, probably some reliance on generational wealth and an inability to adapt when your circumstances in life change. The book is sad, but it's immensely engaging, and it's full of stories that will just leave you scratching your head. Because life in his mother's home was so chaotic, Kirkland decided he'd attend boarding school at Andover, as you probably know, one of the super fancy private schools in New England, which is exactly what one does when you can't afford milk. So, you know, go figure. The whole story, though, just makes me wonder, what's the point of money and social status or standing if you can't create a stable, loving home for your children. Maybe it's because they don't even put that first that they're worried about all this other stuff. I don't know. It also makes me think maybe I should be a bit more empathetic to others because I have no idea what someone else is dealing with or what they have dealt with through their lifetime. I don't know where they're coming from. Maybe I should give them the benefit of the doubt until they no longer deserve it. I don't know. The good news, because this is America, this story has to have a happy ending. And it does. It's not like a fairy tale happy ending. But through Al-Anon and self-determination, Kirkland found himself and his calling and came to terms with his sexuality, which you'll hear about. And he now lives what sounds like a wonderful, stable adulthood. And he currently lives in Baltimore with his husband. They have a dog named Blue. And he's writing and sharing his stories with a lot of people who will benefit from his vulnerability. And I want to say thank you to him for writing this book. I thought it was a great read. I also want to say thank you for sharing your story with our audience, Kirkland. Really enjoyed meeting you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this conversation with Kirkland Hamill, author of the book. What is it? What is it? Say it again. You know, Filthy Beasts. That's what it is. Kirkland Hamill, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Kirkland, I wonder if you might start us off by reading the very first paragraph of the prologue of your book, because you lead us right into the situation, and I'd love to use that as an entry point. Absolutely. When I tell people stories about my mother, as I tend to do, people sometimes ask me how long she's been gone. I think back to the spring day in 1982 when I asked her to drive me into town, and she got into the car with a full glass of scotch, wearing the sunglasses that she never took off and she chewed her nails nervously as she tried to figure out how to start the engine. And thus, we have met your mother. There she is. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> how did your mom grow up, and how did she meet your dad? She actually grew up in Bermuda. So the book is partially set in Bermuda, and she grew up with sort of a working-class dad who worked in a hardware store and a stay-at-home mom, Scottish and English. And, you know, it's been interesting since the book has come out, I've heard from a lot of people who knew her then, but I didn't know anybody who knew her then. I didn't have any pictures of her before she met my father. The only pictures we had of her was when she was 19 years old, which is when she met my dad. So his parents had a home in Bermuda in Tuckerstown, which is sort of the swanky part of the island, one of the swanky parts. The story that I heard was that my father brought five of his friends to Bermuda to his parents' house for a week because they all were going to enlist in Vietnam after that week. And they wanted to have sort of a last hurrah and they wanted girls to spend time with. So my father knew one girl who knew my mother and they all spent the week together. And uh, by the end of the week, you know, my father decided that he'd found the one he wanted to marry. And he tried to enlist in Vietnam was rejected because of a bad back and flat feet. And all of his friends, I think it was his idea is the story that I heard. And all of his friends were enlisted. So his big idea was to enlist, do it before the fighting got really bad, and then get out. And so that idea led to all of his friends going to Vietnam and him coming back to Bermuda to woo my mother. And they were married, I think, six months later. 
It's really interesting that your dad had the idea of enlisting when he came from a very well-to-do family and many well-to-do people back then took other routes to get out of the service. Yes. And I have to preface the story by, I don't know that it's totally true. This is a story that's <laughs> logical. And, you know, it seems a little odd when you think about it. Like we want to enlist in the worst, this is in the God, it would have been in 61, 62, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way he told it was that the fighting wasn't so bad yet, so we can get in and get out before it gets really bad. So it sounds a little bit like revisionist history, mm -hmm. but it's a story that I heard. So who knows? I mean, his family certainly had the means to do a little bone spur situation if they had chosen to. And when we say your father's family was affluent, we don't just mean like they shopped full price at Macy's, meaning they had places on Park Avenue, Bermuda, Adirondack, hunting and fishing clubs, things like that. What was the extent of their wealth? According to family legend, my grandmother in the 40s inherited about $10 million from her father. So they were, you know, that sort of old money they weren't Rockefellers, they weren't Vanderbilts, but they were definitely sort of in that old money ilk with the Park Avenue apartments, the vacation home in Bermuda, the multiple yachts, the Adirondack camp. So it was, the family was all part of that and it had been for generations before that, from what I can tell. You read an interesting description of the clubs in the society, which they hobnobbed with. Being rich back then meant that you could have anything you wanted, but you limited choices to ensure that the new rich people who wanted omelet stations and bottomless mimosas would never even try to join. I would never join a club that didn't have an omelet station. So well done. Who would really? <laughs> yeah. I actually went back with my husband, David, a couple of years ago. Uh, we went back to this hunting. All the clubs have hunting in the title or fishing or mm -hmm. Something and it used to be fox hunting club in Long Island. Clearly, that doesn't happen anymore on Long Island. And I don't think it happened for that long after it was founded in like late 1800s. But it was exactly the same as I remember it as a five and six year old. I mean, even the people who worked there were the same, they're members of the same family. And I always thought the main host was in his 40s or 50s, but he must have been in his 20s because he was still there and invited us in. And we saw all these old photo albums with pictures of my parents at costume parties. And oh, we wow. went for breakfast and there were runny eggs and crisp bacon. And that was sort of your option. <laughs> just, and it hadn't changed one bit. Just the way stuffy old rich people like it. Yeah. My father used to make eggs and I, I mean, they just used to slide right out of the pan. I mean, you almost would eat them in a bowl. So luckily as I got older and could cook my own eggs, we figured out how to cook them a little bit longer. Your folks weren't married for that many years after you were born, but how did they live while they were still married? They lived very well from what I could tell. I mean, we lived in what used to be my grandparents' house, which was a gift, a wedding gift. It was like a 4,000 square foot, I don't know if mansion's the right word, but a pretty big house in Long Island next to my great aunt's mansion, which really was one. It was a 13,000 square foot place called Lauderdale that had an elevator and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. So yeah, I've heard from a lot of family friends after the book came out and my parents were kind of the epicenter of the social scene. I mean, they would go to their house because you know, who else in their early 20s has a 4,000 square foot house to live in and a job that you don't have to go to in the morning. So yeah, they were sort of party central. They often traveled. They were often on my grandfather's yacht, sort of going up and down the main coast. They spent time in Bermuda. They spent time in the Adirondacks. It was all the stuff that you did. And, you know, my grandfather was on the board of Pan American Airways. So the traveling meant, and I remember I had one example of this, I think when I was five or six, we were taken into the airport and taken into this private room with a bartender with a bow tie and an open bar. And, you know, we played with toys on the ground and we could see the planes taking off and flying. And then somebody came and escorted us on the plane before everybody else and served you whatever you wanted. And then everybody else came on the plane. So it wasn't just where they were going and what they were doing, but the way they were doing it was just kind of in this heady space that just doesn't exist anymore unless you're Beyonce or something. But that was sort of the Beyonce of the day, I think, living that way. Right. 
you said your dad didn't really have to work. From your perspective, did the way your dad was raised rob him of a sense of self or a underlying purpose in the way he saw his life? I don't know if it robbed him. I think it was offered to him and he took it willingly. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a better way to put it. It wasn't like my grandfather said, you know, whatever you do, don't go to college. Cause you know, <laughs> he suggested you don't have to go to college because the only reason, like I say in the book, people go to college. This is what my grandfather said to my father was to make money and you're never going to have to worry about that. So don't worry about the college thing. And my grandfather, you know, I think was kind of selfish in the way that he presented it because he wanted a buddy he wanted a buddy to yacht with him up and down the main coast. Mm. And my father was that buddy. So yeah, I think my father, he wasn't a great student. I don't think he was that curious of an individual, you know, when it came to any kind of education, whatever. He was a voracious reader, which is interesting. You know, he just read nonstop, mostly sort of Scott Turo or, you know, those sort of thriller type things. But yeah, I think he just kind of eased into it. You know, I talk a lot about my father eased into a lot of things. And just when the money went away, he kind of like, all right, well, let's ease into what happens next. You say about your dad, my father was not lit from the inside, a blank canvas onto which was painted Nantucket red pants, Gucci loafers, and nondescript button-down short sleeves. I think I've met your dad about 40 (laughs) times. I think there are a lot of them out there. Yes. Yeah, it was just kind of that, you know, it's going to sound a little disparaging, but, you know, sort of like a yellow lab type of fella, you know, not Mm -hmm. that complicated, just sort of very used to a certain way of living and being and perfectly content to be that way without thinking too much outside of what it might be like to be somebody else, because he was never sort of faced with that. And as his fortunes changed, he did everything he could to maintain that sort of distance. He never adapted. And his goal in life seemed to be, you know, to live hard and die young. And I think he died later than he was expecting to. And he died at 76, just to give you an idea of what that means. How'd your life change when your parents split up? Mm. So, you know, we moved to Bermuda. I mean, that's sort of a striking part of the book is after my grandparents died and it was discovered that there really wasn't all this money to live forever without having to figure out how to do something. We moved to upstate New York for two years where everything fell apart. And then, you know, my mother was interesting in the sense that she was very stubborn. So as soon as the lifestyle that she had signed up for was gone, I think she was like, okay, there's a part of her that was ready to move on to something else. But she also moved us to Bermuda. Her parents still lived there. But a very sort of brave choice to move with three young boys to a country that she hadn't lived in for a while, knowing that there wasn't going to be a lot of money to be able to live. But I think she was so disillusioned with my father and, you know, that kind of just sort of lackluster response to how they had moved into a different time of their lives that I think she was just sort of over it. And so we were in upstate New York in two feet of snow one day and literally three days later in our little English schoolboy uniforms going to school in Bermuda in the middle of the school year. It was a huge change, but, you know, one of the incredible traits that my mother had was this sort of ability to go, okay, this is what we're doing now. And there's going to be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're going to do it and we're going to be fine and you're going to be fine. So we just kind of accepted it. But it was, you know, a vastly different place to be than in upstate New York. Bermuda was a vastly different place to be. And it wasn't fine. I mean, money was a huge problem right from the get-go to the point of not knowing where groceries were going to come from. How bad did it get? Well, you know, it's those horrifying images that people have of the mother going up to the cash register and looking through her purse and wondering if there's enough money and people behind averting their eyes because the cashier with that horrible look like you don't have enough money to pay for groceries. That happened all the time. I mean, usually she figured it out. The grocery store that we went to was sort of a small family owned place and my mother grew to know them and they grew an affection for us. And they allowed her to put stuff on credit when she couldn't afford it. But 
Yeah. I mean, it was day to day. We were allowed a half gallon of milk a week between the three of us. So we could just wet our cornflakes. We weren't allowed to have any more because milk in Bermuda was expensive. And this was filled milk. This was like, this wasn't from a cow. This was like reprocessed milk. So, you know, we always had enough food, but there was that underlying anxiety that people who've grown up without money know so well, like, is it going to be okay? And you don't know if it's going to be okay, but my mother put on a front that communicated it was going to be okay, even though at some point it was hard to believe her. Did you buy it? I mean, on an emotional level? Kind of, because at that point you don't really have a choice, but on another level, no. I mean, we could also hear the conversations with my father behind closed doors in which she was begging him to help. And what was relayed back to us was that he wasn't going to and stop being so dramatic and you're fine. And, oh, you're doing this because you want your old lifestyle with the clothes and the whatever. And I'm not giving you money just so you can live the way that you used to. He just never got it because my mother, for what she later became during those years, those early years, she didn't spend any money on herself. She wore the same clothes. She didn't buy you know, there was no jewelry. There was no fancy living. She was just 100% fixated on making sure that we were okay. And is she still working during those years? She worked occasionally. She would get a job and we would hear about it and it would last maybe a few months. And then it would just kind of go away and we didn't know why. So I think she probably had about two jobs during those eight years. And this is where that kind of shift started to happen that's where that conflict of her really wanting to be independent and take care of her children and missing that really just sort of intoxicating lifestyle that she left and not accepting that. I think she thought if I get a real job and start living like a person who has to have a job, then I'm never going to get back to this thing that, you know, was so amazing. So I think she just kind of decided I'm not going to be that person and something will happen to make sure that I don't have to be that person, which eventually it did. And what did that shift look like? Oh, well, she met my stepfather, eventual stepfather, probably eight years into it. And, you know, we had just been stumbling through and I describe it if my father was sort of the JFK, you know, he was like the Aristotle Onassis character. (laughs) (laughs) He just sort of overweight and physically unattractive and wealthy, but in the new money way that just, you know, people like my parents scoffed at previously. And, but he was this amazingly charming and persistent fella. And he decided that he was going to marry my mother. And he just stuck with it until she's like, all right, got nothing better going on. So, Let's do it. And that's when things really sort of moved into kind of the crazy money territory to steal your title. What do you mean by that? Well, because it got crazy. I mean, there was crazy money, which was the old money, crazy money, which Mm -hmm. was very dysfunctional and, you know, had its own special character. And then the new money piece with my stepfather was very gaudy. You know, he owned yachts, but they were big gaudy things with omelet stations. (laughs) Yes. It was an omelet station type of thing. And they used to travel very ostentatiously and make a scene wherever they went and want to be treated like, you know, royalty. And my parents and their parents and grandparents, they all wanted to be taken care of, but it was a much more low key way. And they did not want to be anonymous in any sense. And all the while your mom's sinking deeper and deeper into alcoholism. I am no teetotaler, but when you described your mom's drinking, I was like, how does she function? Not very well. You know, it's one of those things, anybody who's had an alcoholic parent, especially when it starts when you're fairly young, you don't have any context for things. So I would notice when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, that her personality would change when she drank. And, Mm -hmm. you know, she was a pretty gregarious, vivacious person. But when she drank, she would sort of retreat in on herself. And then when she met my stepfather, it just sort of skyrocketed into another realm because the other thing about living in Bermuda, it's a very boozy country. The whole country's awash in booze and 
those sort of old grizzled Bermudians or hardcore day and night drinkers. So it was similar to my parents, but it was a very obvious shift when my stepfather came into the scene that it just sort of ramped up into this kind of epic Betty Davis part of her life. And all this time, you and your brothers are going to the most expensive boarding school on the island. Did this dichotomy between your home life and your school life give you emotional whiplash? Well, but we didn't know, you know, it wasn't a boarding school, but you know, the same idea, you have private school paid for by my father directly. So it it wasn't funneled through my mother. And that's how we could afford it because the education was clearly stated in the divorce decree. And so we went to the best private school. But yeah, when we got home, I would, you notice these things, but it's part of your everyday existence where your classmates get new clothes every now and then. And They don't have to recycle the same things or fix the buttons that fall off. And so you notice those things, but you just kind of think, okay, well, all right, we don't spend money on clothes and other people do. And I knew we couldn't afford it, but you know, that's the thing about having had money and then losing it is that feeling of having money doesn't go away with the not having it. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I didn't consider myself a poor person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think my brothers did either. You know, we couldn't afford things, but we weren't. And this is when we discuss privilege and all of those things. I still consider myself a very privileged person in a lot of ways, even in the midst of not having a lot of money. My father paid for a really good school. We had enough to eat. I was walking around as a white person with the privilege of just having that on a daily basis. So, I'm sure there's a little bit of denial that comes with that too. Maybe it's temporary. Maybe, you know, things are going to get better. All of the friends that you grew up with in the Adirondacks during the summer are the same friends and you do the same things when you go visit your father during the summertime. So it is a little bit of accommodating to different realities. I didn't then perceive myself as a poor person. I thought of myself as somebody living in poor circumstances. Oh, that's interesting. I think the reverse is also true, especially people that grow up poor or middle class and then they make money and they're like, well, I'm not rich. I'm the middle class kid. I just happen to make some money. Isn't that weird? It kind of makes sense. You just sort of get in and all of the external stuff, a lot of that hadn't changed. I mean, again, like we would go visit my father and we were in this beautiful camp on the lake and all of our friends were the same. And we could certainly tell As we got older, they would come with brand new cars and we would be driving my father's old Jeep or whatever. But, you know, when you're that age, you don't fixate so much on it. It's only as you get older, looking back, that you sort of realize how different people's perspectives are and how you grew up sort of shapes who you think you are. And one of the themes of my book is I eventually adapted to the fact we weren't wealthy people anymore and I had to work I had to go to college. I had to figure out how to make a career. I had to figure out how to take care of myself. And there are a lot of people who sort of grow up and lose that money and don't kind of figure out how to adapt to it. And it's a very hard way to go. You say over time, you realize you weren't a wealthy person, but at some time in your youth, I guess in early high school, you decide to enroll at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, not someplace that people struggling for money go to feel normal, I would imagine. Correct. Did you feel self-conscious when you got to Andover? Totally. But Andover was also one of those schools which offered a lot of financial help to people who needed it. It wasn't one of those boarding schools that just had rich people. You really had to be a good enough student to get into Andover. And if you were, the financial aid was there to help you. And so the way it worked for me was I got in and financially we got loans to be able to help me go. And, you know, I described this in the book as my mother saying, you know, I was like, I can't go to Andover. We can't afford it. And she said, you know, if you get in, we'll figure it out. And I thought, oh, way to go, Norma Ray. We'll do it. <laughs> and it <laughs> turns out I got the letter from Andover a couple of years after I graduated with the big sum of money that I owed them. And I called my mother and I said, um, just curious about this letter. Uh, <laughs> didn't know anything about it. She's like, oh yeah, well, you know, that's the way you were able to go to Andover. So now you've got a great education, deal with it. That was her response to my going, "Um, I'm 
still in college. I can't, I can't start paying back my boarding school loans, mother. You need work study in college to pay back your high school student <laughs> loans. Yes. And, you know, I was going to college. I went to Tulane, which again was a very expensive school, mm-hmm. but that's part of the thing. I was aware enough to go, okay, I know when I get out of college that having these names on my resume, Andover and Tulane are going to be helpful in sort of saying something to a potential employer. So I was aware of that early on, but I also had to pay off Tulane loans for 10 to 15 years. And there's, you know, a whole back and forth in the book with my father about paying for it or not paying for it. And he ultimately paid very little. Yeah, but I was also just sort of clueless too. I wasn't doing intensive research on the bang for the buck related to going to certain schools. And I just was barely hanging on The reason I chose Tulane was an Andover counselor said, you should go there. And I'm like, okay, it's in New Orleans. That sounds like fun. The drinking age is 19. Let's do it. I mean, that's as far as I thought about it at that time. You need to get your head together. Go to Tulane. (laughs) Exactly. That's perfect for you. From your alcoholic background, this is an (laughs) ideal city for you to go to college in, you know. But that's really the thing. I mean, you had two parents, and I don't mean to judge. I'm just sort of, I'm offering this to you, and you can oh, tell, please me, do. tell me Go I'm with- wrong. But you had two parents that were sort of infantilized in a lot of way. And your dad told you you should go to community college, which made you feel like a financial problem to be neutralized rather than a possibility to be invested in. And that orientation towards one's kid has got to, it's got to leave a mark. Yeah, he was... Um- I remember having this conversation with him. I was at school and, you know, I was struggling. I was working while I was at school for money just to live. And I got a little bit of money from my father. I don't remember if I got any from my mother at that point. She had money then with my stepfather or my stepfather had money. But I remember having this conversation with him about, you know, I just need a little bit to buy groceries, whatever. And he said something to me like, Kirkland, charity begins at home and that does not include you. I think I'd started going to Alan on at this point and really addressing kind of these fucked up people who, am I allowed to say that on your podcast? You just did. So sure. Okay, let's do it. Who had raised me and, you know, I was aware enough to know, I was like, okay, can you just repeat back what you just said to me? If your <laughs> father had said that to you, how would that make you feel? And this was the other sort of interesting thing about my father is that he actually paused and he's like, well, it probably wouldn't make me feel very good. I was like, well, Uh, thank you. I'm glad you maybe have a little bit of insight as to how I'm hearing what you're telling me right now, basically that you don't matter. So yeah, there was always a little undercurrent of that with him. I didn't get that with my mother. My mother was very fixated on us mattering in all sorts of ways until later. That's another evolution of hers, but certainly early on. But my father was just kind of like, you know, I supply the sperm to have the children and then we're, you know, the mother's supposed to take care of them and the nannies and you're supposed to be fun. And when you reach drinking age, we're supposed to go on the boats together. And that's kind of, I think, how he thought about it. Oh, wow. So you speculate that your father used the trust fund that your grandfather established to fund his own lifestyle. Did you ever get confirmation of that? I didn't. Um, And it was all very mysterious. They used to the term trust fund. I didn't even know what it meant. I knew that it meant money. And I didn't mean trust. (laughs) No, Lack of trust. And I knew it was supposed to be for us to take care of us. And my parents just spent our whole childhoods fighting over it. And we didn't know how much money it was, what it was. It was just this big chunk of something that was supposed to take care of us that never took care of us. So I don't know if my father spent it. I don't know if my mother got some of it eventually. And that's how we were able to survive. It was just a constant drumbeat in the background. So I have no idea. And at the end of the book, I'm like, I still don't know. It just was something that was supposed to take care of us and it didn't. I make copious notes as I write and highlight and question and star all through the book. And in the inside cover of your book, I drew this little triangle with uh, money chaos at one intersection, mom slash alcohol at the other ones, and then coming to terms with sexual orientation on the third. How did these Mm. elements of your life interplay and compound each other? I've talked about this a lot since the book has come out. 
I didn't realize I was gay until I was 30. I wasn't in the closet. I didn't know that I was gay. And a lot of people are, you know, raise their eyebrows at that. But, um, <laughs> Kirkland, Kirkland. Kirkland. What do you mean you didn't know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing. There was so much external confusion in my life with the money and the parents and the alcohol and whatever, that it was very hard to pull out the internal confusion and separate it from the external. So I spent my early years, well, up until I was 30, sort of assuming that I was having all these feelings and having difficulty with relationships and having these attractions that I didn't understand because of all this external stuff related to my mother's alcoholism and my distant father and, you know, all that stuff. So it took until I think I was really ready as a human being to face the truth before I could allow myself to see it. But that's the justification that I used to not face it myself. But as soon as I did, as soon as I knew, I was out. I mean, I was out right away because, you know, I had also learned at that point the corrosive nature of shame and I wasn't mm -hmm. going to live in it. You know, there's so much connection between shame and alcoholism and shame and sexuality. And I just made a decision at that point that both of those things, I'm not going to be ashamed of being gay and I'm not going to be ashamed that I happen to grow up in an alcoholic home. And I'm not going to let all the other sort of shame from other people impact me. And it's not like I suddenly became a healthy person, but it certainly was a good attitude to help me sort of figure out how to navigate it all from there. In both of your parents' subsequent marriages, it was like the mutual enablement society. Did that affect what you were looking for in a husband? Like, did you intentionally seek out stability and lack of drama? Yes. Yeah. I actually, in my early dating life, was attracted to, as I said, people who I don't think liked me very much. And <laughs> I, I think there was- What's more attractive than not being loved? Totally, right? How sexy is that? I mean, you hate <laughs> me. God, let me spend all of my time trying to make you love me. I um, mean, God, you look so, you're so much sexier now. I realized at some point, I started to get very clear about how happy I actually was versus how stimulated I was. I realized that those were two different things. And at some point I just decided I wanted to be happy. And I started to make conscious choices to go after or be with people who were stable and happy and could actually do things that would contribute to my happiness as opposed to me working so hard all of the time oh, right. just to earn their love. And that became crystal clear at me at some point was that, you know, I'm working so hard to get this person to treat me the way that I want to be treated. And you know what? It's going to be a lot simpler is actually finding somebody who likes me. God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, then you have to re sort of calibrate your brain to go, okay, you know, the reason that I'm not instantly just falling over myself with attraction or whatever is because this is how my brain's been wired and you need to start rewiring it a little bit. And then, you know, that stability and that care become sexy as you go along and you realize, okay, I'm putting all this other shit behind me. You stop saying to your partner, if you had any self-respect, you'd be with somebody better. <laughs> well, I tell that story in the book, which is, you know, kind of amazing. The sort of tipping point was I was dating this guy who had a lot of money and, was very proud of himself for having a lot of money. And I remember he gave me a cashmere sweater and I made the mistake of like pulling it up a little bit on my forearms and he nearly fell <laughs> off his chair. Like, Oh my God, you're going to stretch it. And I'm like, Jesus, what the, I felt like a little, you know, one of those stuffed animals that was just sort of being dressed up for his amusement. And I stayed with him not only for a few months, but we were driving home he wanted me to go see dream girls like on the big screen, which in and of itself should have <laughs> come been on, come on to be like, okay, this isn't going to work. Nothing against dream girls, but you know, he's seen it like 10 times and he's like, you can't go on unless you see it. And I could go on. So we were driving home and you know, he said, I'm just, I'm just really struggling with whether you're good enough for me. <laughs> and I mean, it was like a light switch going off in my brain. I mean, the best thing that ever happened to me. I said, okay, For stop sure. the car. I hit the brakes. I'm getting out of the car. I'm never, ever going to talk to you again. And he's like, what are you talking about? I thought we were supposed to be able to talk about this stuff. I was like, no, no, no. 
there's nothing to talk about there. We're done here. <laughs> and it really was sort of the beginning of my going, you know, Kirk, you've got to get your shit together. This is ridiculous. Clarity's a good thing. You spent years trying to please your mother and then a lot of years trying to help her, but she, she just wasn't responsive to your help. Do you think there was any way she possibly could have changed at that point? No. Both of my parents were as stubborn as I think an alcoholic can get. I mean, my father used to say, I know you're going to try to get me to change how I eat and what I drink and what I do. Don't waste your breath. I'm never, ever going to change. Don't ask me to. You're just going to frustrate yourself. So he would say it outright. My mother was just, you know, she didn't think that anything she was doing was wrong. I mean, it's a component of alcoholism to have this sort of narcissistic perspective where she thought she was kind of the center of how everything should be. And everybody around her was the one who was screwed up and needed help and needed a different perspective. So, and that was pretty crystal clear. And, you know, when I started going to Al-Anon, which really sort of saved my life, they would say, you know, give it your best shot, do whatever you think you can. I mean, cry, scream, appeal, just have at it. And when it doesn't work, you're going to realize that there's nothing you can do about it. And it wasn't your fault to begin with. Your mother is who she is. Now you have to figure out who you want to be. And that's the only thing that you need to do now. What your mother does is none of your business. So that was another one of those moments where I was like, okay, I got it. And she died young. 61. Yep. Getting younger all the time. Yeah. Yeah. She was a deep diver, man. I mean, as soon as she started going downhill, I started mourning for her years before she died because I knew how the story was going to eventually end. And, you know, I was lucky enough to realize that I couldn't do anything about it at that point. So I didn't hitch my wagon to, you know, there's a scene that I refer to in the book about having this recurring dream of my mother walking towards a cliff and I'm yelling for her to stop and she eventually falls off the cliff. And then I realize that there's a rope tied around my ankle. I'm going to fall off the cliff with her. And in the dream, a knife appears and I chop the rope just before I'm going over the cliff. You know, so mentally for me, I had cut that rope and it doesn't fix the sadness about it. It doesn't fix the tragedy of it, but certainly on a day-to-day basis, I could live my life without spending my time and my energy trying to get my mother to be somebody that I wanted her to be because that wasn't going to change who I was, which was the only thing that I needed to do. I'm interested to know, how did the way you were raised affect the way you think about money as an adult? An interesting question. (laughs) I became very resourceful. I think I learned the better lesson from it, which was that I could live on very little. I mean, I (laughs) moved out to Seattle after college and I used to look for quarters and the couch to be able to buy a packet of hot dogs and a dozen eggs for the week. And that's what I would live on. And I was fine. I didn't need to have any more than that. I think what can happen, and this has happened with members of my family, is that when you don't give up the idea that that you deserve something or that it's part of your birthright or whatever. When you do get a little bit of money, you spend it on the the most expensive thing at the restaurant or you buy the car that's not very wise and you do all these things and you end up, you sort of repeat the cycle over and over again where you're just never financially stable. And luckily for me, I knew that the very basis of my happiness was going to be making sure that I was financially independent and stable. So that's how I lived my life. Does having lowered those expectations make you more grateful and happy today? Absolutely. I'm very lucky to be married to a guy who is financially stable and successful. And I have been, you know, to a lesser extent, but... I realize now, well, I knew it when I was growing up, just that feeling of insecurity and that fear that if the car breaks down, you're not going to be able to pay for it. I grew up with that feeling and I wanted to get rid of it as soon as I could. And I understood that financial stability was the prerequisite to any other components of building my happiness. So yeah, everything that happens 
now is just sort of icing on the cake. You know, Dave and I, we don't live extravagant lives or very careful with our money. We don't buy expensive cars. We invest in things that are going to appreciate as opposed to not. We don't overspend. We don't have credit card debt. We just don't do any of those things that I knew on a daily basis just made me wake up in the morning with the beginnings of a panic attack. I just didn't want to live that way. I've got two more questions left, but before I go there, is there anything you want to address about the book or anything else that we didn't talk about today? What I would say about writing a book, if there are aspiring writers listening, the thing that it did for me was to really create a narrative of my life that helped me make sense of it, even the parts that didn't make sense. Mm. And I didn't know I was going to get a book deal for it. I always had hope, but I always told myself that if all this was, was an exercise at really digging deep enough to pull out some of the roots of this dysfunction, not to just pretend it never happened, but pulled the roots out enough so that I can sort of hold them up and look at them and go, okay, well, that's why I'm reacting this way. That's why I'm having this feeling. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. If at the end of the day, I had this sort of document that kind of helped me navigate through it all, then it was an absolute priceless use of my time. That being said, if anybody wants to buy the movie rights, please buy the movie rights, <laughs> buy the book, kirklandhamill.com. Send me an email. If you hate it, don't tell me because I don't want to know about it. <laughs> tell your friends, you know, go oh, on to Goodreads, write me a shitty review, but don't tell me. Oh, that's funny. Um, Two more questions. When you see adults living beyond their means today, trying to keep up appearances, what do you want to tell them? It makes me sad. And I realize that it's an external thing. The thing that I've come to understand is that any happiness that you end up having is internally based. It's not because you have the right car or the nice clothes or look a certain way. It has to come from the inside and there's nothing that you can buy that's going to do that. The other thing I would say is that most people don't give a shit. I mean, you think people are looking at you and thinking that you're something special because you can do these things. And most people don't give a shit. They may look at you for a second and go, Ooh, you know, that's a cool car. And then five seconds later, they don't care. And if you think that that somehow means that you are better than somebody else or more valuable or more worthy then you're just wrong. So stop doing it. That's my message. <laughs> Nobody that listens to crazy money lives above their means. That's a rule. We have okay, good. We have well, high I hurdles. Like you write toward the end of the book, history is easier to transcend when you're building towards something new as opposed to living for what's already lost. Kirkland, what are you building toward today? I want to wake up in the morning feeling good about what I've done during that day. I've realized that I have... I think you're given specific gifts that you have an aptitude for things. I have a gift for writing. I have a gift for being able to talk about myself without worrying about what people are going to think. And so I want to use that. And it's sort of an internal compulsion that I have that, you know, I want to get up and honor every day. I became very sort of Oprah-esque in my if you knew you're meant to do something, you need to start doing it now and not wasting your time. And I took that to heart and I don't want to waste any of my time. That's a great place to leave it. I appreciate your time. Kirkland, tell me again what that website is and where people can find out more about your book. Yes, it's W, well, w, obviously, kirklandhamill.com. <laughs> my name, Kirkland, like the Costco collection, Hamill, like Luke Skywalker.com. There's a link to buy the book there, or you can just Google Filthy Beasts, my name. You can get on Amazon. Support your local bookseller, please, if you can. And whoever is listening, if you want to buy the movie rights, you know, I can tell you how to, you know, figure that out too. There you go. All that is available at Kirkland Hamill, H-A-M-I-L-L.com. We'll have links to it in the show notes. Kirkland, great to talk to you. I love the book. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Kirkland. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Like I said, folks, click on the link kirklandhamill.com in the show notes to find out more about Kirkland and where you can buy his excellent book, Filthy Beasts. What are our takeaways this, this fine day? I think my number one takeaway is that it takes somebody who has had money and lost it or had money and experience lost to understand that 
really what's important in life is stability and loving relationships and good friends, that those are the most important things in life. And all the yachts and Nantucket red pants and memberships to fancy country clubs don't do anything for you if you ain't got that. So I just found Crooklyn's answers there at the end about living above our means really, really important and something we can't overemphasize. What else did I come up with to talk about? Oh, I think that this book is going to help a lot of people that are going through some stuff, the children of parents who aren't all there for whatever reason, that aren't as interested in their kids as maybe they're interested in themselves. And I don't mean to be judgmental of Kirkland's parents. They had their own upbringings and who knows what they were about. But nevertheless, there's kids out there that need to know that it's going to be okay. And I'm glad Kirkland shared his story that despite all the chaos in your youth, there is an opportunity to live a stable adulthood and hopefully you'll be able to find that. Lastly, as I mentioned in the podcast, I just love the fact that because of Crazy Money and the audience, you, you person listening on the other end of this, that I get to reach out, contact people like Kirkland and he'll agree to talk to me and share his story. It's been incredibly enriching for me. I think we're on episode six. I, I'm not supposed to say it. We're on a lot of episodes, dozens and dozens of episodes. I've talked to fascinating people and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to do that. That's the kind of work I want to continue to do. And thank you for allowing me to do that. If you have a second, please rate and review this podcast. Scroll down in the app, pass my face, click some stars, write something nice and share this thing with three friends. What do you say? Can we do that? Thank you. All right. Thanks for being here. We've got some other great people coming up next week. Be sure to tune back in. In the meantime, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.